Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to continue now with our next special speaker and researcher in the form of Hugh Newman, my special friend all the way from England. I first met Hugh um, when I went to my first UK um, expedition to share this information with the people in England, not knowing what I was going into, um, and to a place and a, an event called Stars and Stones, the organizer of that John is here as well. And uh, there I met this guy called Hugh Newman, who did such an amazing presentation about the ancient civilizations of, of the Americas that just completely blew my mind. And uh, we immediately struck up a, a great relationship, after which I realized that Hugh runs his own little special show called Megalithomania. Um, lo and behold, not long after that, I went off to England and uh, again and to Glastonbury and my first experience at Megalithomania there. And that resulted in the reason why you're all here today. So it gives me a special, special um, warm, fuzzy feeling to introduce Hugh Newman to you, um, who I believe is going to blow you away. Hugh Newman is an earth mysteries researcher. He travels the world in search of megaliths, lost civilization, and ancient knowledge. He's currently writing about the pre-Mayan and Olmec civilizations of Central America. He traveled there twice in 2003 and 2010 to explore the Olmec civilizations, the Zapotec, and other cultures in search of an ancient megalithic civilization that flourished in this part of the world that now has been almost totally forgotten. As well as being the organizer of megalithomania conferences, he hosts the Avalon Rising Earth Mysteries show on glastonburyradio.com. So put a warm welcome for Hugh Newman, please. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a rousing introduction. I'm quite astonished. Thank you. Blimey. Um, so thank you for being here for my talk. I know it's nearly lunchtime. Uh, we're going to be looking at the civilizations that existed in Mexico and Central America before the Maya. Most of you will be aware of the Mayan civilization because of the famous 2012 calendar and the pyramids and other sites there. But there's a whole other world to look at there that goes way back before the Mayans even existed. And there's even evidence now that the Olmecs and the Zapotec and other unknown cultures that stretch back into prehistory were the original mother civilization of that part of the world. And not only invented the Mayan calendar or the long count calendar, which ends in December 2012, but also taught about the arts of constructing megalithic temples and pyramids and other such um, sites. This is just some of the um, subjects we're going to go through today. There's some really strange things when the more and more you look into ancient Mexico and Guatemala. For example, there's pyramids that are said to be over 7,000 years old, uh, and that's been because of the lava that was tested that was formed upon it. There's lots of connections with South America and Viracocha, and there's the whole Quetzalcoatl myths and legends, which suggest a great maritime civilization ended up in Mesoamerica. And we have to ask where the Olmecs came from, because as you'll see as we go through the talk, you'll realize they certainly weren't from Mexico or Central America. And also you have the famous crystal skulls that appeared in Belize, and also other ones at Monte Alban, which have a potential Olmec site. And also we're going to discuss the implications of the origins of the Mayan or the Long Count calendar that ends in December 2012. So here's just some images of what we know about the Maya. So in Lord Pakal is the figure in the center there. On the top right, you've got the Aztec sunstone, who were much, much later culture. And it just shows you some other codexes and other such temples that the Maya were involved with. This shows you a basic map of Central America where these civilizations flourished. The Olmec heartland in the center of that map is where I'm gonna be focusing my research today. But as we go on, we'll realize that the oldest civilization of that part of the world was actually spreading out throughout that whole part of Central America. And we'll look at evidence of that as we go through the talk. These, this is a close-up of that, the Olmec heartland along the Gulf Coast. 
And you can see many sites there. The large yellow dots, Tres Zapotes, San Lorenzo, and Leventa in particular, are the sites we're going to have a look at today. But there's many other finds that have been discovered and artifacts at many of the other sites listed here. The only site you can really visit that's actually got a pyramid and other such things and earthworks on site is Leventa, and even that's extremely hard to get to. You really have to be a hardened megalithomaniac to visit these sites. But I started up in Jalapa, which is slightly north of Veracruz, to go and look at the great museum there. And you, there's some incredible stonework and the, the famous Olmec heads. And here's just some examples, just to give us a taste of what we're into. And many of these weigh between 15 and 40 tons each. They're made of volcanic basalt and other types of rock from the Tuxla Mountains. And most of the ones we're going to see in the next couple of images are from San Lorenzo or Leventa. Most of them were focused around San Lorenzo, which is said to be the oldest Olmec site in that part of the world. But you can see the immediately negroid features and the strange leather, possibly leather caps that they're wearing. Some people suggest they may be mining helmets. Zachariah Sitch and others have pointed that out. And here's some other ones here. Uh, you can see just the sheer magnitude of these and the intricate carving, which one expert who appeared on BBC TV to try and unlock the mysteries of the Olmecs claimed that the stonework was so sophisticated, it was almost, if not beyond, the level of the, the high level carvings in ancient Egypt. And, it's, and he actually went there, this professor, of, um, and worked with this stone. I found it almost impossible to carve with what the ancients would have carved with. So we're looking at a highly sophisticated civilization. And the dating really starts around 2000 BC with the first evidence. But there's evidence now that goes even further back to 2260 BC and 2500 BC. And we'll have a look at these, these artifacts that back up these dates shortly. But the general consensus is that the Olmecs began around 1800 BC and were flourishing around 1500 to 1200 BC. And you can see the strange braids on the back, on the right hand picture there, on the back of their helmets or the caps that they're wearing. And also you'll notice the bits that have been cut out or chipped out on the left hand one. And many of these, many of these Olmec heads, the great colossal heads, were deliberately destroyed uh, by the, the last part of the Olmec culture around 200 BC to 200 AD. Here are some other examples, mainly from San Lorenzo. Uh, the one on the right is the only one that's smiling out of all 17 heads that have been discovered. Here is all, these are all the heads that have been discovered, the colossal heads so far, but there's others. When I, was, uh, when I went into southern Guatemala, there's evidence, I found evidence of four or five other colossal heads, which are proto olmec culture, slightly later, possibly 500 BC to 100 BC. We'll have a look at them as we go through the talk. But while we're in Jalapa Museum, we should have a look at some of the stonework we're dealing with here. You can see the intricacy of the carving on the left, for instance, and this strange position that many of the statues sit in, which is the same as you get in Pacific cultures, even Buddhist and Far Eastern cultures, but also uh, cultures in South America and virtually all around the world. There's this strange seated position, which uh, we'll, we'll notice that as we go through the talk. There's many statues that mark that. And on the right-hand side, on the bottom there, you've got... Uh, what looks like an altar, is that they've been called altars, and with a, a priest or a shaman emerging from it. And there's lots of connotations of what this could mean. But we'll have a look at some theories as we travel around some of the Olmec sites. One of the things that interested me, and follows on from what Wayne was talking about, is these stretched skulls, or elongated skulls. And the one on the right there, the main picture, is the long skull, which is actually in Jalapa Museum, and is one of the only surviving skeletons from the Gulf Coast or Olmec region. Where they've obviously either it's natural, which is probably slightly unlikely, but they actually had where they used to when they were babies, they actually crushed the head with bits of wood and string, so it would grow longer, and it was possibly part of the priestly elite who were involved in that area. But it, this is where we start to find the similarities with South America and the pre-Incan culture uh, with the legends of Viracocha. On the bottom left there, you see another stretch skull. That's actually from the Nazca Museum in Peru, where all the famous Nazca lines are from. And so we'll, we'll notice this as we go along. On the top left there, you've got this incredibly sophisticated carved turtle, uh, which I just wanted to put in there because it just uh, was a fascinating piece of um, stonework and caught my attention. And it's one thing you notice when you go to Jalapa Museum, if you're going to go and look, you want to go and look at the Olmec societies of ancient Mexico, you really must go to Jalapa Museum, north of Veracruz. It's one of the most important places where all the artifacts are found. And interestingly, the oldest 
sites, the oldest artefacts which are in the museum are, cl are close to the entrance. And as you go further down the steps throughout the whole length of the museum, you get to slightly more modern cultures to around uh, uh, 1000 AD. And everything seems to get smaller. So it's like the, the ancient cultures had all the huge megalithic stonework and they found it effortless to carve and work with. Whereas as time went on, that knowledge seemed to have been forgotten. And you can clearly see that as you walk through Halapa Museum. And it's something that's, that's been noted by a lot of different researchers over the years uh, with these ancient megalithic cultures. This is a place called Santiago Tuxla. And this is the largest stone head of all. Uh, this is 40 tons, and it's the only one, and it's one of the latest ones, but it's the only one where the eyes are closed. And we're looking at possibly about 700 BC for this one. And in the museum at Santiago Tuxla, and they, all these sites come from, uh, all, all these artifacts and stones come from Tres Zapotes, which has been mainly destroyed now, but many of the stonework has uh, been saved. And on the right there, You'll see two images, again, of very negroid features with this a very interesting kind of rockabilly haircut. And this is something that surprisingly comes up over and over again in the Olmec world. And, and, and in other parts of the world, as you research this, you find that's the case. And also the style, because they think these were placed um, as sort of mortuaries or, or where people were buried. And, and the same kind of style has been discovered in Africa. And you can see these images here from Mexico, uh, sorry, from Egypt and also from Nubia. And you can see the, on the, the, the picture on the left there. And on the right hand side, you can see the similarities in the facial features of, uh, of African people with the Olmecs. And on the bottom right there is a statue that's now in the Smithsonian Museum in New York. And again, you can see the clearly Olmec or Negroid features with that very interesting haircut. So back to San Diego Tuxla and the museum there. Again, this is one of the original stone heads, and you can see the huge earring that they're wearing. And also, in the background, there's a large photo of some of the mounds or the pyramids that still exist at the site. But these aren't accessible anymore. They're very difficult to get to. And on the back of the head, you can see clearly the seven braids, which is an African a tradition, which goes back uh, a couple of thousand years. So I managed to get up to Tres Zapotes. It's not easy to get to these sites, I emphasize. If you really want to go, either encourage and make Megalithomania do a tour there so we can all go together, or just be, just be aware it's going to be quite a challenge. But it really is worth it if you're a true megalithomaniac at heart. So again, there's more Olmec heads. There's some very strange statues there. And on the bottom right there, you can see a large stone made out of the volcanic basalt which is acoustic. As you tap it in different parts, you find there's acoustic qualities, as though they were using this kind of thing in the construction of some of the temples and also some of the artifacts at the sites. This is the famous Long Count calendar evidence. This was discovered by Matthew Sterling, who is the prominent Olmec archaeologist back in the 40s and 50s. And before this was discovered, it was thought that the Mayans were the original civilization of Central America. And the earliest known long count date, which is, that's, this is, this is the calendar, which begins in 3113 BC and ends in December the 21st, 2012. The earliest recorded stone or of that particular calendar was about 220 AD, and it was discovered at a Mayan site. But when Matthew Sterling uncovered Tres Zapotes and found this particular stone, it marks the date 31 BC. So we're looking at a couple of hundred years before the known Mayan peoples were there. And they, it's now evident that the Olmecs invented this particular calendar and this particular count. There's also evidence that they were using different, Maya, that later the Mayans were using different calendars, such as the Harb calendar, which is a 365 day solar calendar, and also the 260 day Zolkin or sacred calendar. This is just a close up of the stone itself and how they worked out the dates on it. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the other side of the stone is this very unusual person uh, in some kind of strange uh, sort of temp uh, breastplate, and also a strange face at the bottom of it, if you can see that there. And on the left-hand side is one of the original photographs of the stone itself. And you can actually see this stone still in the museum at Tres Zapotes. There are other calendar dates of interest. Uh, Chiapa de Corzo, has another one of a very uh, roughly the same time. And these early calendar dates around that era are called cycle seven calendar dates. 
The problem with this one, which is something I've been working with with Mayan scholar and 2012 expert Jeff Stray, is the problem is some of it was missing. And so the interpretation of it when you're using the dot and bar counting system of the ancient uh, Central Americans, that there's a multiple different dates that could have been deciphered from this. And the other part of the stone has never been found, unfortunately. But we did a bit of homework on this and a bit of research. And this is what we, these are some of the dates we came up with. It's quite a lot to take in here immediately. But you can see some of the dates are very interesting. Some are standard dates, which are around the 31 BC mark. But there's ones down the bottom there, especially the 3,249 BC one, the one on the bottom, is particularly interesting to me because that is just 120 or 20, 130 years before the origins of the Long Count calendar, before the start date in 3,113 BC. And we have other dates, number 10 and 9, for instance, 2,480 BC and 2,736 BC. So these dates, I'm going to just want you to take note of these because as we move through, well, some of these dates will be popping up again, although officially the archaeologists and the historians won't go back any further than 1800 BC. And this is something that baffles me. And it's the same kind of principles and same problems that Michael and other researchers are coming across as they research these ancient sites. These are some more dates that um, Jeff Stray put together. He's a very, a very vigilant researcher. But again, we're seeing dates that go back to the start of the Olmec calendar or the Mayan calendar around the 3,113 3, BC mark and others similar to it. Now, there's no, until that other stone is found, we can't, we can't put the, the exact date in, unfortunately. So when that gets discovered, it's probably been destroyed, uh, then we'll know for sure. But the evidence is mounting that there were the Olmecs or other ancient cultures existing in that area back then. Now, San Lorenzo is possibly the most important site there. It was the largest settlement of the Olmecs going up into the hills where they found fascinating uh, artifacts and even waterways and drainage systems. And this head was only discovered about eight years ago, um, very recently. And so this is like head number 17. And it actually was very freaky for the person who discovered it. It was an archaeologist, I think, from America. And as she was in a boat looking through this swamp to see if any artifacts were in the area, suddenly this huge head was looking up at her. And she kind of almost fell out of the boat in astonishment. But it's one of the most well-preserved heads left. And, uh, and you can see the fascinating headdress on it as well. And also on the left there, you can see the st stone spheres, which is another tradition of the Olmecs. And you get this kind of thing happening in Costa Rica and also in Bosnia. Here are some of the other stonework. On the top right there, you can see this very interesting looking chap who seems to look like a European, and even has facial hair. And then there's some very other strange stones. There's one on the bottom left, obviously, which has been semi-mutilated. This happens a lot at San Lorenzo. It's almost like the whole place was closed down. And the final people there, or a different tribe, came in and started destroying the entire site. But they were up to some very interesting things at San Lorenzo. I just discovered this recently uh, when I was looking through some uh, academic papers. And this came up. There's some iron ore magnets that were obviously used by the people of San Lorenzo, going back 1,200 to 1,400 BC. And the site itself, where San Lorenzo originally was, there's a great, huge magnet magnetic anomaly actually at the site itself. And so they think they may have been working with these particular earth energies um, in this part of the world. And they had an understanding uh, of the different types of electric charge, uh, magnetism, and also telluric currents, which is something we'll be looking at as we go along. There's also evidence now at San Lorenzo that there was the first place, first people to invent the compass, even before the Chinese. And so this is now coming to the fore. And the, but the thing with that is, there's lots of evidence at many of these sites that the Chinese or the Orientals were, were, at, San, were at some of the Olmec sites. Uh, and astonishing as it may sound, this seems to certainly be the case. And here's just, this just shows you some comparisons. We'll, we'll, we'll have quite a few of these throughout the talk. Um, with Egypt, there's lots of Egyptian connections with the Olmecs, a huge amount. There's been a lot of research done on this by various scholars over the last couple of decades. And here's just one example, uh, a site called Porta Nevo, which is um, just near San Lorenzo. And you get the same image of the Egyptian goddess Nut supporting the hieroglyphic sign for sky. And again, more and more of these will be coming up as we go along. 
So this is where this was discovered. You can see just next to the San Lorenzo on the right of it is Portero Nuevo. Uh, which, which there's nothing left there now, just artif artifacts that have been discovered. And if you look up at where La Venta is, up here, just next to that is San Andreas. And this is where these artifacts were discovered. And these are one of, some of the only artifacts of that kind of era which suggest that they had a writing system in place, fully formed, almost, uh, you know, it was fully formed before they got there. It didn't develop anywhere, particularly in Mexico or that part of the world. Some of the glyphs represent uh, some, of, some of the 260-day Zolkin calendar as well. And so we're looking at a kind of, we're not, they're not sure of the dates of this. We think it's about um, 1,200, again, 1,400 BC. So if that is the case, it's certainly the oldest evidence of the Zolkin calendar, which has become famous uh, in recent times with the popularity of the Mayan calendar and the dream spell. So if we move up to Leventa, which is very near San Andres, um, this just shows you the main site here. You, it's, one of the, it's the earliest known pyramid officially in Central America, although as we will see, there are possibly some that are much, much older. Again, on the top left, you get the extremely negroid features, which is something that Matthew Sterling, when he discovered the first of these Olmec heads, was astonished by how negroid they looked. And they certainly do. The more you look, the more you have to accept that. Although the academics slammed it, especially Glyn Daniel and certain other academics who notoriously um, like to slam the alternative thinkers or even the not so alternative thinkers. And they suggest that all the Olmec features are actually of Central America. And yet they don't, it doesn't make any sense when you start looking at it more deeply. So you can see this layout of the site, and you'll notice these particular pavements, which are in part of the Leventa site. Now, you can't actually see the pavements anymore, but they've reconstructed one and moved it to a nearby place called Leventa Park in the town of Villa Hermosa. And interestingly, they've, they've recently done some extra digging on one of these and found that it's not just a one layer. There's actually 28 layers, and it's made of serpentine. And so we're talking like over potentially a thousand tons of serpentine have been made into these alternating layers all the way down, like a cube of, of mosaiced serpentine. And why would they do that? Why would they bury it 20 feet below the ground, going down to 50 feet below the ground? No one knows this. And it's a very strange phenomenon which has been happening at Leventa. But as we'll see, there are certain things going on with the earth energies at Leventa, which are of high interest to me, and it could be something to do with that. These are some of the other stones. There's two heads here on the, on the left and in the middle, which are mutilated Olmec heads. They've been completely destroyed. And on the right-hand side, we have a huge stele, which no one has quite been able to decipher just yet. But the one on the right is probably 20 feet tall. So these were megalithic engineers of the highest order. And I'm just comparing my face to one of the faces, heads discovered at Leventa. This is actually in Leventa Park, and it's well worth going to a Villa Hermosa. And most of the actual stones from Leventa have been taken there because the oil industry was surrounding Leventa itself and almost destroyed the entire site and all the megalithic stonework there. But these were fortunately saved 40 years ago and taken to this particular park. These are some of the other interesting megalithic stones there. On the bottom right, this is a classic tomb of the Olmecs for the royalty or the priestly caste. On the top right, there's some very interesting figure here who seems to be flying, pointing at someone, and wearing some kind of crash helmet. And he, and he looks particularly Western or American. or He doesn't look Central American. He looks like he's from the Middle East or the West, or somewhere like that. This is another, yet another Olmec head, one of the 17. This one's about 25 tons. And it's, again, beautiful stonework. It's been quite weathered, possibly partly destroyed. This is one of the altars with the incredibly interesting serpent symbolism on it. And you can see on the top left there, just here, this is, uh, looks like a queen or a princess, and her arm seems to turn into a serpent. And it follows round here. This is going down the side round, round here. And it follows across here. And then this guy, whoever this is, is holding the serpents against the ground. And then it continues around the other side. You'll also notice, uh, not particularly, there's, there's another altar, but there's serpents coming in 
from different angles as well. So this serpent symbolism becomes very fascinating uh, the more you look into these sites because it seems to be related to the earliest references of Quetzalcoatl or the plumed serpent of ancient Mexican mythology. Also with this, I found this interesting because this was actually moved from the original site, but the guy I was with when we explored this particular area, the energy coming off this was astonishing and you could feel it Ten, about eight meters away, and, I just, and even though it had been moved and placed at you know, a random you know, museum in some town, I could not cut, it was so powerful. Me and this guy were like, whoa, what's this? There's like a force field around it. And it really moved us, and really made us realize that these stones, even if they've been moved from their original site, still hold the messages and the energy of what the ancients were working with. And it didn't happen on any other stones, it didn't happen at particularly any other sites, but this particular stone, it, it, it stunned us. And, and when we go back to the original Leventa site, you realize that there's a great, famous as well, earth energy current that went originally through this stone. So maybe a residue of that still survives within the stone itself. Here's one of the final Olmec heads that was discovered at Leventa and moved to Leventa Park in Villa Hermosa. And here's just some other carvings and some waterworks which were discovered at Leventa here. And also, you can see clearly some Olmec glyphs here, but no one knows really what they are or what language they're from. And again, this guy looks like he's got a beard and a very strange headdress. He doesn't particularly look Central American. And there's still big question marks over what these glyphs could mean and why there were Negroid peoples and white people with beards in Central America way before anyone was supposed to have been there, certainly before Columbus. And this, back, this is back at the Leventa site. This is some of the, where the stone heads originally were. These are just, um, I think, fiberglass copies that have been placed exactly where they were discovered. Here, in the middle here, this is the center point, the sort of main central hub of the site. This is where many basalt columns were put very tightly together into concentric circles, right, to a center point where it seems like that they would have meetings. And there's evidence of this when they discovered this on the bottom left here. They've had all these small jade Olmec figurines buried with one of the great pavements near one of these. And, and with all these stones that look like the same as the basalt stones that are still in the middle of the site, but a smaller version, actually all in situ, as though they were having some ceremony or some meeting there. And look at the heads. Very strange, again, elongated heads and very oriental features. So we're not just talking about Caucasians, Negroids, but we're looking at possibly Oriental uh, contact here as well. Or there's other aspects, they could have come from somewhere else altogether. But this is how deep these serpentine pavements go and, how, and the sheer amount of effort and work. And they would take, bringing these from many miles around as well. This is the Great Pyramid at the site. It's only uh, an earthen mound now. And it, has seven, it seems to have seven sides on it, seven or eight sides, and they're kind of like a fluted cone. However, it's now believed it could well have been a four-sided pyramid, or it's even a step pyramid, but the weathering has destroyed the shape of it. And again, we have this Egyptian-looking figure sitting here. As you can see, it was quite wet there. I, I chose the rainy season to go there, uh, just because I'm English, I guess. And, uh, and it was very, very wet, but I struggled through and had the most amazing time there, to be honest with you. I was the only person at the site for like half a day, and so I just hung out there and got soaked through to the bone, uh, but had an amazing experience there. And this is where I discovered some of these fascinating earth energies, which is an area of research I've been looking into for the last 10 years. This is the other side of the pyramid. And this is where some of the stelae and the heads are. And going through the whole site, from the heads at the other end, through this, so, and, uh, excuse me, and then out the other side of the pyramid, there's this energy line which I picked up and I, I recorded through dowsing. And it also went through this, which is the altar we looked at, a fake one there now, but where the original altar that I had the experience with got moved. And the energy line went through that and actually several energy lines congregated throughout the site. And I'd already been researching this line, these great global currents called the Rainbow Serpent and the Plume Serpent, coincidentally, that go all the way around the planet, two great currents. And this is the map I kind of created of that part of Mexico. 
And the line comes in at Quetzalcoatlus, and this is, means serpent sanctuary. And this is where Quetzalcoatl was supposed to, he, came, he arrived in that area on a, on a raft of serpents with a band of followers. And he was a tall, pale man with a beard and bright blue eyes, and wore robes, and could speak every language of the natives and started being, acting like a missionary almost and uh, teaching the arts and sciences and getting everybody tuned up to this knowledge that somehow he'd bought. And then this line goes through Leventa, goes through the site we just looked at, and it also goes through Tortuguero, which is very interesting, which we'll have a little we'll brief look at later, and Palenque, which is one of the famous early Mayan sites, and Lord Pakal and others. And it goes all the way down through... Uh, Guatemala and through Capan in Honduras. This is the global version of that same line. The bit we were looking at is just here. I also, this is the famous extension of the famous Michael and Mary lines that go across southern Britain. I'm sure most, many of you have probably heard of those. And then it extends all the way around the planet and goes to all these other sites. I've got details, much more detailed analysis of this in my book about earth grids, and I'll be mentioning it again tomorrow in my talk about earth grids. But it also goes through here, this is where two of the great currents cross, at Lake Titicaca in uh, Bolivia-Peru border. And we'll look at that in more detail tomorrow. This is me at Coats the Cocos, excuse the close up. Um, but this is this area here, and this is classically, there's nothing there now, it's just a busy oil town, there's nothing going on, there's no, there's no plaque saying Quetzalcoatl was here or anything. But this is the area, so I find this very interesting, and I'm not sure, I've just started noticing this, that where is Quetzalcoatl a myth mythological being who they represented, and it was actually an earth energy current, which has lots of different powers associated with it. And it's just fascinating that he was said to come into this Gulf Coast area and leave. He actually left after 20 years of spreading his knowledge and, and getting all his followers and people, you know, bringing high civilization and uh, megalithic construction and magic and agriculture and all these other skills that he got pushed out by a dark god of that area. And here's just some images of him here, actually, different versions. And it looks surprisingly like um, Mr. J here. Uh, from the, I think it's the Christian tradition or something. And again, we see this. This is Quetzalcoatl. So this is actually the pyramid of Tio, one of the pyramids in Teotihuacan. This is uh, a Mayan interpretation of him. They called him Kuku Khan. And there's another version of him here. Now, he brought lots of different things to the country. It's very strange. These myths didn't just exist with the Olmecs, although, to be honest with you, there's nothing really of Olmec literature or writing to take these legends from. But the early Mayans, the Zapotec, the Toltecs, the Aztec, and many other cultures of Central America all knew about Quetzalcoatl and based their, all their religions upon his presence in being there in ancient times. And when Quetzalcoatl was driven out after teaching all these different cultures by this dark god, he, pro he left at Coats of Cocos on a raft of serpents, promising to return uh, at a certain date. Uh, and every, I think every eight years, that certain date would come round in the different calendars. And then, unfortunately, Hernan Cortes turned up on one of those years that Quetzalcoatl was supposed to return in the 15, early 1500s. And so what happened was that he was quite tall. He had pale skin, a beard, had a band of followers. He came on ships, or rafts of serpents, they called it. And they turned up in the same area where the legendary Quetzalcoatl did many thousands of years earlier. So they immediately had an advantage over the locals and managed to dominate and take over the entire Aztec civilization that was still present at the time in that part of the world. This just shows you the extension of this energy line I'm talking about. You can see where it goes here. And also, there's many, I've only just put this together recently. I need to do more research because there's many of these sites aren't still marked and you have to sort of trace them on Google Earth and other programs. But what is interesting is that most of the sites associated with these energy lines are Quetzalcoatl or Cuckoo Clan sites. And we'll see that as we go along. But first of all, I just want to give you a quick outline of Tortuguero. This is a much later site. It's contemporary with Palenque, about um, probably just about four or 500 AD. 
but it's one of the only sites, it's now been completely destroyed. I, I went and visited it myself to see what was left of it. But it's one of the only sites in the whole Mayan world that actually has an inscription that details the date December the 21st, 2012. And it's, been, it's now hidden away in the museum in Villa Hermosa. I went to see, see the stone itself, but I, I wasn't given access. Uh, but I have a friend over there who's Ivan Orozco, who's going to be uh, researching this for me. And this is what John Major Jenkins and Jeff Stray and other Mayan scholars have been discussing for the last few years since it was discovered. And it's dismissed by the academics completely, saying it's like a fake or it doesn't mean anything, that it's actually the, the calendar's gone for much, much longer. But it's carved in stone and you can't deny it. And so there's something very important about this. And the interesting thing, right at the end of the inscription with the last bit that's chipped off, it says that it will, be dis, dis, it will be the descent of the nine gods to the, and then it's chipped off. And so they're wondering who these nine gods are, but then you realize the nine gods, there was nine gods in ancient Egypt. There were nine gods in the ancient Mayan world as well and different cultures. And so, but they're gonna to descend to what? And so this is like the mystery. So we have to wait till December the 21st, 2012 to find out, I'm afraid. Watch this space. And then it also goes through Palenque, which was a site contemporary with Tortuguero. This is the famous lid, Lord Pacal's lid. It looks like he's driving a spaceship up into the sky, according to some people. Traditionally, he's descending into the underworld, but the debate is still out on this. This is the famous jade mask that he wore. And we actually met someone who knew one of the families who were the first people to excavate at Palenque and actually uncovered the tomb of Pakal, and they said when they saw the first few bones come out, it would have been, he was definitely nine feet or taller, without a doubt. He was certainly nine foot tall, minimum. And so we're talking about a giant here. Uh, so where he came from, we don't know, but it's, it's, again, this is on that same energy current we looked at earlier. This just shows you some of the stonework here. It's not as impressive as the Olmex. It's a much later date. However, some parts of the site talk of the nine gods. So we're seeing the same mythology as a Tortuguero stone present here and in Egypt. And some of the meg some of, there were a few megaliths there built into some of the pyramids, but nothing particularly that caught my attention. And down in Honduras, we have Capan, where the energy line continues. And this is a very interesting site, because a lot of the stonework there, it looks particularly like they're Oriental or Chinese. And they have lots of symbology. They even have an elephant, as you can see in the picture there, Stella B. Um, and it has a whole different feel to it. It really does. And they found lots and lots of archaeological evidence relating this site and other sites in the Mayan world to China. There was a lot going on in China at the same time as there was here. And so I find this particularly interesting. It needs a little bit more research before I can comment any further on it. So this is, we're going to be looking at sites down this way now. This is like the border of Guatemala's around here. That's Guatemala, that's Mexico. And we were up here before, at all the Olmec sites, Chapter Corso and others. But Izapa, it's a particularly interesting place. And it seems like a proto-Olmec culture that were contemporary with the very early Mayans. And John Major Jenkins and other researchers believe that was the site where the Olmec teachings integrated with the Mayan world. And then it spread out from there. And here we see some of the stonework here. Particularly interesting is the, the top right, the serpent. Uh, the serpent symbolism. And on the bottom right there is a very famous stele with a carving on it, which no one's really been able to decipher, but um, a couple of researchers back in the 70s noticed how similar it was um, to one of these carvings or paintings from a tomb in Egypt. And you can see the same thing, a serpent underneath with wings going up on the side of the being in the center there. And, uh, and lots of other symbolism that seems to match. Again, we're seeing the serpent and the feathers, or the serpent and the wings, the, the plumed serpent, Quetzalcoatl, or Viracocha in South America. Again, the symbolism keeps coming up. One of the most interesting things about Zapa, to me, is these carvings here. On the top right there, these are clearly psilocybin mushrooms, which grew all around that part of the world in antiquity, uh, which are the same as like magic mushrooms, which you get in England and other places. On the left there, is a Bufo marinus toad. Now this toad, if you excrete a substance from his shoulders, you get something called 5-MeO-DMT. And when smoked in the correct manner, you have the most powerful psychedelic experience available on the planet. 
And it seems that the people of Azapa and the, even the Olmecs now, because they found many uh, Bufo Marinas toad bones at San Lorenzo, they were definitely a psychedelic culture. And some people believe, John Major Jenkins, the mind scholar included, is that in fact that was one of their ways of reaching into pre reaching into distant past and distant future times through the psychonautical uh, state of the mind. Uh, there's a lot more to that. There's a lot of research that's been done on that now, and even some cultures who still live there still ingest these substances in a ceremonial and shamanic fashion. And it's still, it's obviously very popular among the alternative uh, groups as well. And many people actually go to Mexico to have these ceremonies and to get into the mindset of the ancient Maya and Olmecs. Further along, if we head further east into Guatemala, we reach um, as, as a town called Santa Lucia, and there's many sites nearby there where amazing stonework. Again, we think it's proto-Olmec, possibly 200 BC to 500 BC, so it's not classic Olmec. But again, look at this strange stonework here. And on the left, it looks almost like Sumerian or Egyptian. And on the right, we have this bizarre uh, teddy bear-looking guy, uh, with some, and they're all wearing boxing gloves. And also, we have these strange symbols here which no one's been able to decipher. So no one knows where this culture came from, although there are extreme similarities with the Olmecs, particularly when we look at some of the heads we found in, that have been discovered in the area too. This is a place called Bilbao, and this just shows you a great, these are some of the great megalithic slabs with incredibly intricate carvings on them, showing scenes of battles and ceremonies and shamanic experiences, just still lying about in a field. Be warned though, Santa Lucia is the most dangerous town in Guatemala, possibly in Central America. We didn't know that, but we went there anyway. And uh, I dragged my girlfriend at the time along, and then when we arrived there, we looked at a newspaper, wondered why the hotel was empty, and realized that several tourists had been shot and killed off the same bus we got off two days previously. So we timed that one well. Here's some other sites in that same field. And apparently everyone on this particular street has guns, so just be careful. And this just shows you the detail of some of the carvings that we can see here. And then there's lots of little museums called Finkers nearby. This is one of them, Finca Las Illusions. And you can, if you get a driver, you can go around all these sites, make sure he's a big guy, preferably with a gun, and you should be fine. This is just one of the stele here. Uh, this, the thing with this area here, unlike other, unlike other places in the Olmec or the Azarpan kind of cultures, that they, they have multiple, they have several of these exactly the same, and several of these exactly the same, so often two or three or four. So whether they were like sort of markers around a site, we don't know. In the museum there, uh, again, we find evidence of the psilocybin mushroom. So we know what they're up to. And some megalithic blocks just hanging about outside a church. Uh, often, obviously, as we get everywhere on the planet, churches were built on top of the prehistoric sites. We see the entwined serpent, which is something you get with these earth energies. You always find two currents weaving around each other, re weaving around like a caduceus. And so this symbolism here I found very interesting. What's also interesting is what's in its mouth. It kind of looks like a human. Can you see that little human there? Trying to get out? Being eaten by two serpents at once. Ooh. Or it could symbolize just their tongues coming out. We don't know. And here's just some of the stonework that was, luckily it was saved before they built all the sugar plantations there. And here we have a place called La Democracia, which isn't far from there. This was originally from a site called Monte Alto. Again, it looks kind of like an Olmec head, but with very strange features and, and a pair of sunglasses on. Uh, possibly the earliest known sunglasses recorded in stone. But you can see the features are very different to the Olmecs. They, they cover their eyes up, and the features don't look sort of negroid. They don't really look Central American. So where, you know, what, what did they base this upon? And then we have the Buddha figures that have been discovered as well, sort of sitting down meditating like big babies. And again, there's no explanation for these either. And so, and these just appeared at this site called Monte Alto, but a lot of people now, including David Hatch Childress and other researchers, believe these are the later Olmec culture. If you move along further east in southern Guatemala, there's a fascinating site called Carigua. And this is where you get huge anamorph, zoomorph figures and very large stele, some of them up to 35 feet high. This one interested me, because if you look at the stones underneath it, 
It looks like it used to be a dolmen. It's like a table stone, a uh, table megalithic site, where you have three stones and then one resting on top, flat, like a roof on it. And then I think some of these could have been much more ancient megalithic sites and incorporated into the cultures that flourished in these areas. And this turned up in this photo as well. And I didn't have a flash on. I didn't use a camera that had ever taken any orb photographs before. In the middle of the day, this turned up. So again, I think there's something to do with these strange energies you get out of these sites. This shows you some of the huge stelae. I couldn't even get it all in the photo because they're like 35 feet tall. Sandstone, quite easy to carve, but obviously they've been quite badly eroded over time. And just at some of the, the temple at the other end of the site, there's again quite large megalithic blocks. And obviously I got excited being a megalithomaniac and started pointing them out and getting photos of them. There's even some strange toes here as well coming out of the wall. Uh, so I found that quite bizarre. And then when I met, I met a guy there who um, got chatting with, ended up staying with his family because I had nowhere to stay that night. And he ended up getting out 40 different artifacts that he'd personally collected from different parts of Guatemala. And again, I mean, it's just a couple of examples here. This here looks at very Olmec features, and this was found in southern Guatemala. So whether there was trading going on or traveling of the Olmecs, and also these other ones here, very unusual, very unusual uh, artifacts. And he's got like 40 or so of these, and he just keeps them privately, because all the museums will just take them and put them in, the, in their basements. So he keeps them to himself. And if you go to Guatemala City itself, um, which is going back west again, there's a site that used to be there, called this, I'm not gonna even try and pronounce that. And this site, which is even earlier officially than the Olmec sites, goes back to 2500 BC and was being used for 2000 years. Um, and these are some of the artifacts from there. And look, you can see these kind of strange sunglasses, strange features. Again, we have the Bufo Marinus toad, evidence of more psychedelic activity and the strange wolf or fox-like animal coming out of a mushroom. And there's more beautifully designed stonework as well. And here's some other ones here. Again, clearly Olmec features. And also mushrooms, uh, the psychedelic um, psilocybin mushroom. And as you have head further west, back towards Mexico, near the Mexico-Guatemala border, there's a site called Abash Takalik. And here is where recently they've discovered what appears to be the 18th Olmec head, officially. This is what's left of it, not much. Um, and here's some what looks like classic European megalithic chambers, uh, which is very bizarre to find that at a site in Mexico. And here it just shows you some other strange features, some strange faces. Again, an Olmec, Olmecoid head, another one here. And also this sort of crouched uh, Buddha figure and these strange crocodile it's coming out of the um, side of the pyramid. And then also I went to Belize, which is the, it used to be called British Honduras on the eastern coast. And I wanted to see if there's any Olmec evidence there, and then I, I found it at the first site I went to called Keros in Belize, North Belize. And they, they found a jadeite Olmec pendant, and then there's some stucco faces carved onto some of the, the temple, uh, carved onto some of the sides of the pyramid, were clearly Olmecoid again quite computerized, kind of robotic looking uh, Olmex. And this is where I met a guy called Jim, who's an explorer. And he found this mysterious seated figure when he was exploring the Maya mountains in southern Belize, the area of Lubantu and where the, um, <clears throat> where the crystal skull, the famous crystal skull was discovered. And again, we find this seated position. This is something that keeps coming up at almost every Olmec site. Um, I think it's called Kirizo or something like that. And, and again, so this is potentially an Olmec wooden artifact, which is one of the only ones ever discovered, and he discovered it himself. And he actually used to live with Anna Mitchell Hedges. He used to be best friends with her, who was the owner of the famous Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. Some other sites in Belize worth checking out is Lamanai. Again, we have these Olmec stucco faces on the sides of one of the pyramid recently discovered. And then Lubantum, which is right down south towards Punta Gorda. And again, we get these very strange polygonal megalithic walls. And of course, the famous crystal skull that was discovered there, apparently, possibly, by Anna Mitchell Hedges. And uh, strangely, following on neatly from some of the artifacts Wayne Herschel was showing in this talk, look at this. It looks like a sort of spaceman. This is just in the museum there. 
And on the right-hand side, we have, again, Olmecoid features present and being discovered at Luban II. So potentially, the Olmecs could have stretched all across Central America into many different places. And here's a picture of, of the famous Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. Just a few miles away from Luban II is Nimli Punit. And this is another interesting uh, early Mayan site where no one's sure who the culture was really here. But you get very large stelae there, huge megalithic stelae. And uh, this is one of the most interesting places combined with Luban II in the whole of Central America. It's a fascinating site. And my Mayan guide, whose family I ended up staying with for a few days, were telling me about some strange lights that appeared at these sites and moved in straight lines between Luban Tum and Nimli Punit. And he gave me a sort of um, a whole story of that in English. I've actually got it on video. So um, when we get it together, we'll be able to sort of show you that. And we're going to head back up now from right down here, up back up to Mexico City, this region here. And the Olmecs seem to have spread quite far and wide, not just on the Gulf Coast and down into Guatemala. They seem to have moved uh, right up to Mexico City and beyond. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> this is a place called Chalcatzingo, and there's not much left here. Just up on the mountains um, south of Mexico City, these incredible carvings were discovered and evidence of an Olmec uh, temple site settlement. And again, we have this very unusual sort of shaman, priest, king, or whatever, sitting inside what looks like a cave with all these psychedelic imagery coming out here. And again, this is another fascinating shamanic-looking thing with flying people, which we saw at Leventa. So this has just been, uh, there's not much left to see here, but I, intend, I haven't been there myself, but I intend to go there next time I'm in Mexico. And just south of Mexico City 2, which is actually you can still get to on the subway, is a place called Quilquilco. And this is potentially the oldest pyramid in the Americas, if not the world. There was a lava flow that got co covered this site multiple times in, into the past. And one of the first ever dating they did back in the 1920s, they found that it was 7,000 years old when they carbon dated the lava. So immediately, we're looking at possibly the oldest pyramid, certainly in Central America, if not the world. However, more dating was done on it since then, and it's found now they think it's like 800 BC to 200 BC, and now officially it's about 20 AD. So immediately we've lost just over uh, 5,000 years just because of um, different dating techniques. But there's some very interesting stuff that's been discovered here. This is one of them. This just shows you a perfect double spiral carved, which is something you get in the European sites, also in Malta. But interestingly, also at Tiwanaku in Bolivia, you get this double spiral motif. If you go to the museum in Tiwanaku in Bolivia, you find that there. And there's other connections with that as well, with, with Tiwanaku and with the Peruvian sites, at a place called Tula, which is slightly, uh, I think, east of Mexico City, quite easy, no, northeast of Mexico City. And this is a Toltec site who they believe were involved with the Olmecs before that. And you can see some of the beautiful stonework here. And immediately it caught my attention because I'd been to Tiwanaku a couple of years before in Bolivia. And if you look at the similarity between these and the one on the left there, which is Tiwanaku, you can see the striking similarity between that and that. And so there seems to be a connection. And yet in Tiwanaku, they revered Viracocha, again, the plumed serpent. Whereas in, in Tula, it was Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent. So there's obviously some kind of connection here between different parts of the Americas. And they had these strange things they, they carry in their hands at the sites in Tula, like they do in Tiwanaku as well, which some people suggest the kind of strange plasma guns they used to, or well, Zachariah Sitchin proposed this, to actually like carve and manipulate rock because obviously they had to do that to create all these incredible sites. Interestingly, just outside Tula, in the car park, is the, the remnants of what looks like a stone circle, like a classic British, European, megalithic stone circle. And no one's ever mentioned this. You wouldn't know it was there if you hadn't, you know, if you'd just seen, been looking at photos in books or on the internet. But you can see clearly that, you know, when I investigated this and checked out the layout, it looks like it was, used to be a circle. So potentially, you know, Quetzalcoatl and his followers from 3000 BC and beyond were megalithic builders, you know, and they started like this and it developed from there. You, you get a similar thing actually at Teotihuacan, 
again, near Mexico City. Not only do you get the, an entire pyramid dedicated to Quetzalcoatl, with the plumed serpent imagery, you actually get a megalith sitting in the middle of the main plaza, which no one mentions. And interestingly, there's Olmec jade faces are being discovered there. So there's now a suggestion that Teotihuacan was actually an Olmec site, and it wasn't built by the Teotihuacanians or the Maya or the Toltecs or the Zapotecs. It was actually Olmec. And this just shows you a view, um, the Pyramid of the Sun in the distance, viewed from the Pyramid of the Moon. There's a whole avenue, obviously. It's quite a famous site. Most people know about this. But under the Pyramid of the Sun, this is where they've discovered an incredibly interesting cave system. And it forms into like a, a great cross that goes all the way under the pyramid. And they found crucibles with mercury in it and things like this, and all these strange artifacts, including the Jadeite Olmec mask. So we're looking at potentially this was like a slightly later Olmec culture moving through different parts of Mexico. So we've already seen at Quilquilco, the oldest pyramid in the world potentially. Now Cholula, which is near Puebla, which is about 40 miles east of Mexico City, is the largest pyramid in the world by far. It's three times bigger than the Great Pyramid in Giza. It's twice as big as the Bosnian pyramids. And it's absolutely huge. I mean, when Cortes turned up here, it's one of the first places they went to in the early 1500s. They just thought it was a natural hill because it was so big. And, they, and there was all this, because it had been kind of, even when they turned up in the 1500s, it was super ancient. And they assumed that Cortes was Quetzalcoatl returning to his pyramid. This was a pyramid dedicated and built by Quetzalcoatl in prehistory, even though it's by far the largest pyramid in Central America and, and even the world. And there's a lot of interesting stories. There's different layers of pyramids have been built upon this, going back into the distant past, at least, I think, to the Olmec times. And it's well worth a visit. There's a fascinating museum there as well. And just to put the icing on the cake, there seems to be what looks like a battered old Olmec head still in situ at the site. Around the front of the site, near the main entrance, we have sort of megalithic evidence here as well. And this is a stone I just spotted, and it's got a perfectly cut square in it, which is exactly like you get in different parts of Mexico and also in Britain, these men and toll stones. And on the top of it, you have a little mortise and tenon joint, which is what you get a stone hinge, uh, how the big lintels sit upon the main megalithic stones there. And you also get this in, in not only in different parts of Mexico, but also in South America yet again. And this just shows you the different layers of the pyramid here, the Great Pyramid. I mean, this is the largest pyramid by far in the world. Uh, and you can still check it out today. You can even go into some of the tunnels still if you catch it at the right time of year when there's no flooding. And then we move further east again in Mexico to a place called Monte Alban. Fascinating place. They think, again, this is a proto-Olmec site. All these carved stones, again, Olmec features, huge astronomically aligned uh, megaliths. And these stones were the earliest stonework there, and it was later built by other people. And here's just some of the Olmec features and some of the carvings as well. And outside in the car park, again, like at Tula, megalithic marvels exist in car parks in Mexico. This is where you need to be looking. Huge, great Stonehenge-type Trilithon temple. Um, just, you, can, you don't even have to pay to go in that, but you can just wander about. Again, this is like megalithic construction of the highest order. Slightly further east than that is a place called Mitla, a contemporary with Monte Alban, at least 500 BC, more like 900 BC. Again, the megalithic builders were there too. And you can see this in some of the lintels, which weigh up to about 20 to 40 tons each. Again, there's Quetzalcoatl myths here too, and here's just some of the columns. Perfectly cut column. And this just shows you the sheer size of some of these stones with this little girl just happened to get in the way of my photo. And it's famous for these mosaic mosaics really that's why most people go there to look at but if you've got a megalithic head on like i permanently have you find a lot more there here's some other stonework there again as i was driving away in my little tuk tuk down back to where i was going to catch my bus just looked over a wall and found another great megalithic temple just where they, the kids play football uh, which i thought was quite interesting and, uh, and there's many other sites in Mexico. I mean, I've just sort of scratched the surface here. The more you explore, the more you find. You really have to go there and explore. And it's such a fascinating place to, to visit. It really is beautiful and amazing people there. One of my favorite places was Tikal. And this is where this stone was originally discovered. And this is one of the only stones 
that actually depicts the end, one of the ends of the world. And there's, there's like five different worlds have been destroyed by cataclysms, as according to the Mayans and the earlier cultures of that area. And uh, fortunately, ironically, this got taken to the German uh, Museum in Berlin and got destroyed in the first, Second World War when it was bombed. But luckily, photos and uh, paintings and, and, and pencil work were, were taken of it. So you really have to question what were they doing there? Why were they designing these calendars? Why were they marking this start date, 3113 BC, and deliberately marking the end date in December 2012? Is there a significance there? Did something happen back in that era before that start date? And is something going to happen around the end of this end date? Is it going to be cataclysmic or is it going to be something more profound and spiritual? And, and, or is it an awakening unfolding? Or is it simply this? Thank you very much. <laughs>